do have a special treat, and I want our skit team, King of Hearts skit team, to come up. We have a skit for you. Everybody, uh, come on, come on, right now. Go ahead and line up on stage. And let's talk it. Bring down the lights a little bit. It's better than that. <laughs> Go ahead. And I'll, I'll be explaining a bit about, um, actually, we need the masks. Go ahead and, and go and grab the mask. Um, so, the King of Hearts skit, um, these young people have been practicing uh, this skit for almost two months now. And, and we have different teams that are performing the skits, and, and they have just poured their heart out and practiced really hard. And the main goal is not so that we can show how great of an actor or actress as we are, but, but it is to portray the message of hope, the message that brings eternal life. And today's message, um, you will see that it's heavily related to the heart. So as you watch, um, try and like figure out what's going on, you know, and a little bit will explain what's happening. Okay, so, you ready? Let's give him a hand, all right?
Good job. Yeah, take a bow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Did you guys enjoy that? Was, it, was that nice? Yeah, very nice, very nice. <laughs> well, um, if, if you're here for the first time, uh, my name is uh, Casey, and I'm the pastor for this English congregation here, so I want to welcome uh, the visitors, whether you're here or watching uh, on Facebook Live, we welcome you. And so, I, I love this skit, King of Hearts. Uh, I, I've seen it performed all over the world, I've also uh, performed it many times myself, um, playing all the various characters, so I, I have a deep passion for this skit, and at, as you can see, it's, it's a very powerful and meaningful skit. And so let me take a moment to, to explain what, what's going on here, okay? Um, and most of you will probably figure out mostly of, of what is going on, but, but I think the main idea for this skit called the King of Hearts is that if Jesus is not the king of your heart, then we will be living in a false identity. But if Jesus is truly the king of your heart, then you can live your true identity. You can live to be your real self. And, and this skit speaks to both Christians and non-Christians. And, and eat, you know, just because we're Christian, it doesn't mean that Jesus is the king of our hearts. We confess that he is God but he may not be the Lord and the king of our hearts. And so there might be many areas of our lives that, that we are still the king of our own hearts, and we're calling the shots, and we're, we just ignore Jesus altogether. And we know that is very easy to do. You know? And so um, we, we see the four different characters. The first one, played by Vivian, right, was the pretty girl. And, and she's trying to portray this perfect image uh, that... that the outer beauty is, is what matters the most, right? And uh, I, I, uh, I think about the, the like Miss America pageants, you know? They try to portray this perfect image of themselves. But when she took the mask off, we could see that, that she was insecure, that she felt um, ugly on the inside, right? At, at first, she was, she was looking at the mirror and, and thinking how pretty she is, and she was really self-focused and self-conscious, but later on, when she took the mask off, she shattered the mirror because she couldn't face uh, the reality of who she truly was. And then the second person, played by Rachel, she played a great clown. Uh, and, you know, she had to, to put on this mask of, of being always happy, that I always have to be happy. I, I'm the life of the party, and I'll do anything that, that makes myself happy. And I don't know if you can tell, but she was a uh, smoking weed. <laughs> she was smoking weed and, and drinking and just doing whatever that makes her happy. You know, as we said before, it's, yeah, well, quite a right? And, and that was her. That was the clown. But when she took her mask off, she, you, we saw that she was really depressed. She was really lonely, and she's reaching out for help. And she felt all alone, so much so to a point that she wanted to commit suicide. And then the third person, played by Josh, he played a great macho man, this tough guy. And, and he had to have this image of, man, I, I'm tough. Don't mess with me. I'm going to challenge you. You know, he's pointing out to the people around him, you, come here. I'm going to challenge you. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick your butt if you don't listen to what I say. Intimidation is what he's trying to do, right? Because actually... When he took the mask off, why was he trying to do that? We could see the fear in his eyes. We could see, like, he was, he was trying to say, no, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. So, so that, that playing the tough man protects himself from that insecurity. He doesn't want to get hurt, so he hurts other people. You guys recognize Macho Man Randy Savage? <laughs> or the wrestling fan of the 80s? And then the last one, played by Vicky, it was, it was the black and white mask with a cross across her face. And she played the hypocrite or the self-righteous person, always judging, always pointing. No, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. And you, you're inferior. But me, I'm, 
I'm better than you. So always judging, always thinking, man, I'm the better one. But when the mask came off, what did we see? We saw that she was blind. She didn't know where she was going. She thought she, she saw the truth, but in actuality, she couldn't see anything. As Jesus said, you know, don't, don't be the judge. Don't be a hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye first. There's a log in your eye, and you're complaining about the little specks in other people's eyes. And so came the Savior, portrayed by Nathan, played a great Jesus, <laughs> coming out and, and redeeming mankind by, by dying on the cross. And, and, and by doing so, he forgave us of our sin. Our sins are washed away, and he's able to, to give us a new heart, a brand new heart. He, does, he doesn't just repair a broken heart. He gives us a brand new heart. That Jesus, he's the, he's the ultimate heart surgeon. And he gives a brand new heart. He tears the hearts off it. And now they're able to live in their true identity. They can forsake in their false identity, their false self. And, and, and there they can be truly happy. And every person, when, when the false identity fell off, became joyful. And at the end, we saw you know, Macho Man kind of going back to his mask again, right? Because sometimes we know it's easy to backslide. It's easy to go back to the old ways. And he's trying to put on his mask again. But Jesus, is, he's the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, a hundred chances. He's saying, no, you don't have to go back to that old way of life. I'm going to take that off of you because my life is your life. I am in you and you are in me. So we can have victory in Christ. And we live in this grace and mercy that God offers us. And that is the hope of the gospel. That is the good news of the gospel that, that Jesus came to die on the cross for us, to give us a new life, to give us a new heart. And that is something that we embrace. And that's why we're sitting here uh, this morning. Right? And so the skit will lead us right into the series that we started four weeks ago called The Habits of Happiness. And today's message will be based on Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. So if you have a Bible, please take it out. And the title is How to Keep Your Heart Joyful. So today we're really focusing on the heart. And, and that's why we have a little heart cloud here. We're really focusing on our heart. And uh, also take out your, your pen and, and note, notes. And if you don't have a pen, just raise your hand. Our ushers will give you a um, pen and handout. If you don't have one, just uh, keep your hands raised up high so they can come and help you. And so let's keep in mind the context of this passage again. Remember um, that... The book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. And during this time, he was locked up in the Roman prison for doing the work of the ministry, for preaching the gospel. And he writes this very personal letter to the Christians in Philippi. And remember last week, we talked about how, how Paul affirmed about many great things that the church has. They, they have, you know, they, they endured, they were faithful, they were generous. They had a lot of good qualities as a church. But Paul, he also addressed their problem, their issue of disunity, the issue of bickering with one another, of disharmony. And so as a result, Paul tells them, hey guys, we have to get along, so please be humble. Look at Jesus. He was God. He is God. But he came down in humility and became like man, and died on the cross, and he was obedient unto death. That's the ultimate humility. Now copy that, my fellow believers in Philippi. Copy what Jesus did in his humility, and honor each other more than yourselves. Serve one another. Honor one another. And so today we continue in Paul's letter after he wrote that, saying, hey, imitate Christ's humility. And he follows with this in verse 12. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill 
his good purpose. Now, this is actually a very, very important passage in the Bible that scholars and theologians have debated over the centuries about what this verse means. And, and, and Paul is saying, copy, imitate Christ's humility. And I know it's hard work. I know it's hard work. So you got to work it out. You got to work out your salvation. I know it's hard, but work it out. But it is God who works in you, okay? And, and so what do the scholars debate on this? They debate the, the doctrine of free will and predestination. I don't know if you've ever heard of that debate, but how do we come to know God? How do we receive salvation? Is it completely 100% depending on our free will to choose God? to choose to obey God, to choose to surrender to God, therefore we have salvation? Or is it the work of God where he predestined us before the foundations of time and he elected you? And so if he elected you, you will be saved. But if he didn't elect you, then there's no chance that you'll ever be saved because there's nothing you can do. Because it is God who works in you to, to even give you the desire to obey. So if he doesn't work in you to give you that desire, you would never come to know him. So that's the great debate. One side are the Armenians about the free will, and one side are the Calvinists talking about predestination. And it's a, it's, it's a millennial long debate. But here we see that Paul is saying, well, it's both. It's God who works in you, but it is you who have to work it out. But we know that we do not receive salvation by works. We can't earn salvation. It's not merit-based. We know that from other parts of the Bible, we know that salvation is a free gift. We cannot earn it. Okay? And so what this means is God already gave you something. He gave you salvation. It's like, Think about your muscles, right? How many of you actually work out in the gym? Like, if you've been to the gym in the past five years, at least once, raise your hand. (laughs) We're Chinese. We don't go to the gym. We do Tai Chi. Ah, you know. And so God is saying, what this is saying is, you know what? God created you, right? He gave you the muscles that you have. Just touch your biceps, all right? You didn't create these biceps, all right, even though they may be tiny or flabby, you have the bicep muscles. God gave it to you, but it is your responsibility to go to the gym and, and pump those biceps and work, at, work it out. Right? God gave you your body. It, it's you that have to go out and, and, and run and train if you want to be fit. Well, so, is it, so how do you get fit? Is it God or is it you? Well, it's both. God gave you the body, but you have to work it out. You got to work out those guns for the ultimate gun show, right, guys? You know, I saw them flexing in the back. I can resist. And so God does his part, and we do our part. And, and, and I heard um, Pastor John Wimber say that, you know, we don't have to debate about free will or predestination because they're like the two pedals on a bicycle. It, it, it's both and at the same time. Okay? It's both God and us working together, laboring together. Okay, let's move on. We don't have too much time. Philippians 2 continues, verse 14. Paul says to the Philippians, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. (coughs) In verse 14, I want to highlight, Paul says, do not complain about anything. Do not grumble. Do everything without grumbling and complaining, you know. He says, don't complain under any circumstances. Well, why did he say that? Because he knew that that was an issue for the Philippians. And that was their weakness. They complained, they argued, they demanded with 
uh, one another, and, and that was such a killjoy. That stole the joy out of their lives. And so in life, what are the five most common uh, things that we lose our joy over? You know, what is the cause of your unhappiness right now? And, and there might be a few of us that, that are sitting here today, this morning, that are unhappy. I, I don't know. I can't see your heart, but you know. God knows. So why? So let's take a look at the top five reasons, all right? Five ways that we often lose our joy, and you can write this down. And first is fearing that we're all on our own. Fearing we're all on our own. You know, and, and that can be re- reflected by, by the clown character. That, that the clown felt lonely, and he was depressed, and he was reaching out for help, but no one was there to notice her pain. And so she, she decided to take her own life. What's the second thing that we lose our joy over? Is that we fight over the small stuff. Fighting over the small stuff. And that can be like the macho man mentality, right? You know, you give me a slanted look. I think you disrespect me. And I'm going to pick a fight with you. But wait, maybe that person's eyes are just slanted. They're not looking at you slantedly, you know? So... Fighting over the small stuff, always yelling to intimidate people to get what they want. Third, feeling guilty or ashamed. And guilt is, the difference is this, guilt is feeling bad for what you have done. That's guilt. Ashamed is letting the act define who you are. That's the difference. Oh, I lied to my parents. I feel guilty. Now I label myself as a perpetual liar. Now I'm ashamed. Oh, I stole something from the store. I feel guilty for that. But now I'm labeled as a thief, perpetual thief. And now I'm ashamed. Number four, forgetting what God has promised. God has promised forgiveness if we confess our sins. But the hypocrites, the self-righteous, they they forget that. They have a a short-term memory of our own failure. And they have a long-term memory of other people's failure. And they they forget God's promise that that we are forgiven if we confess our sin. But the hypocrites always want to point out other people's faults. And the fifth killjoy is focusing only on ourselves. Focusing only on ourselves. And we could see that with the pretty girl, that she only looked at herself. She, didn't, she wasn't even looking at other people. Right? She was self-focused, self-conscious, but she was feeling ugly on the inside. And so to address those five ways that we lose our joy, this passage has the five cures to regain our joy. And first, to address the fear that I'm all on my own, no one cares about me, well, the first thing is this. Remember that God is with me, He is in me, and he is for me. You can write that down. Because in Philippians 2.13, it says, For God, it is God who works in you, in you to will and to act. Okay, he works in you. But first, you must invite him in to your life first. Then he can work in you. If you don't invite him in, he can't work in you. So you got to invite him in. Jesus, come into my life. Please, I need you. Then he will work in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. And then Romans 8, 38 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So we know God is for us. He's not against us. He's for us. So who can be against us? No one can defeat us because we're on the same side. God says, I'm on your side. I'm for you. And then Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will be with you. That's what Jesus said. I will be with you. So he is with us. And that's recorded in John 14. So some of us might be feeling that God abandoned us for some reason. But you know what? That is a lie from hell. That's the enemy's voice. And don't listen to it. Don't ever believe in it. And even though we may feel that way, we may feel we've been abandoned, but it is not true. Because our faith is, has to trump our feelings. Our faith has to be here. Our feeling has, has to be here. That no matter how we feel, we have faith about what the Bible says about us. And for those of us who, who fear abandonment, 
We got to declare this truth to ourselves, okay? Repeat after me, guys. Repeat after me. Say, God is with me. He is in me. And he is for me. Okay. God is with me. I, I have to believe that. And King David, last week we studied King David, he believed it. He wrote, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life in Psalm 23. Well, despite of all David's sin, goodness and mercy followed him. But what is, what is the goodness of God? What is it? Well, it's God giving you things that you don't deserve. That's the goodness of God. You got a promotion? Didn't deserve it? Well, that's God's goodness. You know, yesterday, uh, when my friend was telling me that she got a dream job promotion, uh, and it was a government offer, and it was a senior level position that she didn't really qualify for. Even her boss said, how did you even get this job? This is a senior level position. You don't have the background for this. And she's like, mm, I got it. You know, <laughs> God shouldn't have gotten that awesome job. Didn't deserve it. But guess what? God's goodness is in her life. Well, what's, what's God's mercy? Well, it's God not giving you the punishment that you deserve because we've confessed our sin and he's forgiven us. So he doesn't give us the punishment that we deserve, and that's mercy. Guess what? You did something that should have put you in jail? Maybe. But why are you still sitting here today and not in jail? Because it's God's mercy following you, okay? Here's a scenario. A depressed Christian man walks into a bar to numb himself with whiskey because of the pain in his life, okay? Where's God? God's not going to abandon him just because he walks into a bar. God's mercy will follow that man into the bar. And God's mercy and goodness will follow you, not because you deserve it, not because you are good, but because God is good. That's why his mercy will follow you into that God-forsaken place. Because he is good. And it is because God loves you despite of yourself. God loves you despite of your sin and weakness. And that's why every day we should raise our hands into the air. And when we come on Sunday mornings to worship God, that's why we should like just express with all of our soul and being, like, God, you are good. God, you are merciful upon me. You are that good. And your kindness leads me to repentance. You know, the second cure for an unhappy heart is this. Be grateful and never grumble. Be grateful and never grumble. And this deals with the fact that we tend to fight over the small stuff. And this is a hard habit to break because we are negative by nature. And, and we're conditioned by our culture to complain and criticize about everything. You know, years ago, there was a book that came out, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And then in fine print, it says, and it's all small stuff. You know, the, the fact is, 90% of the things that we complain about and sweat over are small stuff. 90%. Maybe ten, 5 or 10% are, are the big things that deserve our attention. Okay? But this book was written mainly for an American audience. And, and for us, we can easily complain about everything. And, and here are some of the typical things that, that we complain about. What, what do we complain about? Traffic on the 405. When we see this, our blood pressure rises, right? We're not on the freeway yet, but we... We turn into it, and we see this line. We're like, oh, my gosh, I wish I can turn out right now. You know? Raises our blood pressure. <laughs> when we see a grandpa driving 30 miles an hour on a 50-mile lane, we're like, oh, my gosh, please. <laughs> What's going on? Right? When we get in line at Costco, when we see this dragon of a lion, we know we got to wait 30 minutes, and we only have like 10 minutes because we need to get to church or something, you know, or pick up kids from Chinese school. We're like, I'm still stuck in this line. <laughs> you know? <laughs> or this. Our zipper gets stuck unevenly, and we get so upset over it. Right? Or this. Your mother-in-law. Right? And we sweat over these small stuff, right? And sometimes we can think, well, what's God's will for my life? We, we always think, what's God's will? I don't know what to do with my life. Well, you know what? It's simple. And First Thessalonians says, 
and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What? That's God's will for my life is to give thanks? Yeah, it's that simple. It's not complicated. Give thanks for what you have right now. That is God's will for your life. And you know what? That's step A. Because God is saying, this is the prerequisite for me to tell you more about your purpose in life. Because if you can't even give thanks for what you have now, I'm not going to show you step B. Learn to give thanks. Then I'll show you. Then I'll place you in a position of influence. Then you'll be ready for your assignment. Okay. Number three. How to regain my joy is to keep my conscience clear. Keep my conscience clear. In verse 15 it says, So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in this crooked generation, so that you may shine like stars among the sky. Blameless and pure. That, that, that means keeping our conscience clear. Right? Matthew 5 eight says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Keep our hearts pure. Keep our hearts clean. But how? How do we do that? Because a lot of times, we've already messed up. This is a done deal. We, we've already messed up. But there, 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 is, um, there is something that we can do, and it's called confession. It's called confession. Having a clear conscience, meaning that to keep a short account with God. That means at the end of every day, I got to take a spiritual inventory, and I got to say, God, is there something between me and you today? Because I'm not going to go to bed today with junk. I picked up some, some garbage, maybe in my attitude, maybe in my, my reactions, maybe something I did at school or at home with my family. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did, did things that I shouldn't have done. Is there anything, Lord? And let Holy Spirit shine upon you. Bring those things to mind. You know? and, and here's an exercise that we can practice. It's called spiritual breathing. You know, just sit quietly and, and, and just when you breathe in, you, bring the, you breathe in God's goodness, God's forgiveness, God's power, God's word. And when you, you breathe out, just confess your sins to God. And the Bible says he is just to forgive you of all your unrighteousness. So breathe those bad things out. All this junk in my life today, breathe out. Breathe in God's forgiveness, his mercy, his goodness. You know? We can practice that at home. Okay? The fourth way to regain our joy in our heart is to memorize God's word and live it. Memorize God's word and live it. In verse 16, Paul says, hold firmly to the word of life. Hold it firm." You got your Bible, hold it firm, because this is the word of life. And in Psalm 119, it says, your principles make me happy. This is what David said. Your principles make me happy, like your word makes me happy, and I never forget your word, David says. I never forget. What does that mean? It means he memorized it. He memorized God's word. And it is in your word that I'm happy, okay? So practically, you know, if if you're not familiar with Scripture memorization, try, try to memorize the, the famous ones first, because that's easy, easier, because that's recited all the time at different places, like the Lord's Prayer, or Psalm 23, or like Matthew 6.33, or like John 3.16. The, the ones that are more, try to memorize those first, you know, and make it fun. If you have kids, make it fun. Play a game with your family. Hey, who can memorize the fastest, you know, or, or buy a drawing Bible, I know I think Julia has one. You got a drawing Bible. You can draw like scripture, like on, on the on the margins of your Bible. It leaves a you know as you draw, you memorize the scripture. And I I remember I used when when my brother and I when we were kids in Taiwan, my uncle would give us five NT wu kuai qian you know tai bi five NT for memorizing, Tang Shi San Bai So like like poems, okay, and and we would try really hard be there sitting there for half an hour, an hour, try to memorize a poem just for that 5NT. What is that? Like 20 cents, a dime, right? 
Micah would not memorize something for a dime. He's like, up the price, up the price, please. <laughs> and and why, why is memorizing scripture important? For example, let's say that, that you're acting depressed. Okay? And that is because you feel depressed, so you act depressed. And if you feel depressed, it is because you're thinking about depressing thoughts. And if you want to get out of your depressing thoughts, we have to change the way that we think. Romans says we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. All the change starts up here, not in the outward behavior. It starts here in your mind. And when you recite, when you memorize the Word of God, when you recite the promises of God to yourself, eventually your faith, your faith will increase. And your mind will begin to change. And your mind starts getting renewed, and you'll be filled with hope and joy. And that's why memorizing God's word is so important. If you have never done it, you can start this week, okay? And this is a question that we can ask. How is meditating similar to warring? Because they look kind of different. But how how is it similar? Well, they're similar because we're thinking about the same thing over and over and over again. You know, think about this. What's the one thing that you worried about the most this week? Okay? Think of it in your mind. Probably, I don't know, work. Maybe your work. Maybe your kids. Maybe your bills. Maybe about not getting a return phone call from a person you like. Whatever it is, that thing is playing over and over again in your mind. That's called worrying. But what's meditating? It's having the Word of God in you over and over and over again. So if you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate. You just got to keep your mind on the positive things instead of the negative things. Okay. What's the fifth thing? The fifth way to regain our joy when we lose it is to use my life to serve God by serving others. And this is to fix the problem of focusing, always focusing on myself. This way, when we serve God by serving others, we're putting our focus on other people. And in Matthew 25, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And specifically, he was talking about the poor. He was talking about the marginalized, the people in need. If you give them a cup of cold water, you have given it to me. If you put clothes on their naked back, you have put clothes on me. If you give them a slice of pizza, you gave a slice of pizza to me. You know, for example, like on, on, on Friday night at Lighthouse, I was facilitating the, the, the high school girls group. And, and, and Annie was like, you know, I, I was... I was Talking about, hey, do you guys know who, who, uh, who, who's prone to serve others? Who's prone to honor others more than themselves? And Annie's like, it's Ruth. When we go to Soup Plantation, she always brings me stuff. And she always gives me food before I eat, you know? And I, I had to tell that. To, not, not meant to embarrass you, Ruth and Annie, but, but I just had to tell it because that's a perfect example. It's something that we can do in our daily lives. It's not something... You know, another girl, I won't name names. Oh, yeah. I, I'm like, oh, so when you go to, guys go to lunch or dinner, who, who pours the water or the tea? And a particular person said, I do. I'm like, oh, that's good, because I'm forced to. <laughs> My parents said I have to because I'm the youngest. <laughs> you know, but, but when it comes from your heart, then that's truly you're, you're serving other people. And, and, and that equals to serving God, okay? And in verse 17, Paul says this. Paul says, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, what does that even mean? I'm pour, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, Paul is saying, I'm in jail right now. What that means is, even if they spill my blood, even if they kill me, even if I get executed here in prison, because of the sacrifice and service that we have made, I'm, I'm still going to rejoice. 
says, even if I'm executed, I'm still going to rejoice because of the sacrifice and the service that we have all done together. And so on, on your handout, I want you to circle the word sacrifice. I want you to circle the word service and rejoice because these three words are linked together. Without being sacrificial, without service to others, you will not be able to rejoice. That is the secret to regaining your joy, guys. In other words, generosity, sacrifice, you know, we're not dying for the gospel in Orange County, right? But we can translate that into generosity. Do we give my life away? Do, do, do I give out my time, my energy, my resources to help other people? Because Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's a hard thing to learn. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus is saying, you'll be more happy when you give things away rather than taking them in. And grandparents, I think, experience this the most. Grandparents are so happy when when they give gifts to their grandchildren. You know, I see it in my own family. I see it in other families. And, and my mom would be so happy. When, you know, she'll be like at Macy's or Nordstrom's, and, and she'll call me. Hey, I want to buy some gifts for, for my grandkids. What can I get? What can I get? I'm like, I don't know anything you want. Oh, I want to get something. I'm, I'm, so, uh, I'm so excited shopping for the Christmas present or whatever present, birthday present. And I see that brings joy to her, to, buy, to give rather than to receive, right? That's Jesus' teaching. So let me ask you two questions, because these two questions will determine the level of joy in your life. First, where do you sacrificially volunteer to serve others? Where do you do that? Think about it. And, and this is the quickest way to actually cure depression because by volunteering to serve others we get the focus off of ourselves off of our problems and we get to help other people and that will help us tremendously okay and then number two the second question for the, your test of joy is your heart growing more generous every year are you more generous with your resources this year than last year or are we kind of stuck in our level of generosity and our level of, of giving because that's a good indicator. When you're stuck in your generosity, that's a good indication that you're probably stuck in your capacity for greater joy as well. So think about these two questions right now, okay? I'm not going to talk anymore, but I'm going to invite the worship team to come up as you ponder on these two questions. And we're going to respond to God in prayer, in song, and also in our offerings. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. And let us all stand as we respond in our worship to God. season he's learning to be sacrificially generous to his friends in need and he learned to trust God with his finances and when he learned to give when he learned to bless others he said man God just opened up the doors of opportunity for more more opportunities and jobs more as he gave more as he blessed others God blessed him even more that's just a lesson and you know what we can never outgive God because God is a generous God
Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we respond to your message, God, that you are teaching us to have joy in our lives through our sacrificial service to others and through generosity towards those in need. And I pray the Holy Spirit, you speak to every heart. I know you're working on us we're all in different st- stages of our lives right now and I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts concerning your will in our lives God and I also bless the offering this morning may the finances go towards fulfilling kingdom purposes may it help those in need may it help get the gospel out into the world thank you Lord Thank you, Lord. Let us receive the blessing. May the love of our Father in heaven, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the fellowship of the sweet Spirit of God be with us always and forever. Amen. Amen. Be sure to greet one another before you take off today.